Okay, kicking off. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Sorry, we're getting it started a few minutes late. Uh, this is just a, a, a broad update on SRF. What I'm going to cover today is uh, a little summary of, of SRF to date. It's only been two years. Our goals for the rest of 2020, we'll talk about coronavirus, we'll talk about our grants, our financials, our new board and what it means, and then suggest the next steps for everybody. If you have questions, please feel free to um, send them through the chat. And, and we will get to them at the end. So a brief overview of SRF to date. This organization was created in 2018. In 2018, we did a few things. We created the organization and we filed for tax exempt status. Um, we gave three multi-year grants to Johns Hopkins, Scripps, and Baylor slash Texas Children's. We set up a Facebook page and a blog, got a whole post out, and we began, began engaging parents and other SYNGAP organizations through the SYNGAP Global Network. So as many of you know, um, Virginia created the SYNGAP Global Network to organize all the different groups around the world, and, and most of us belong to that, and it's been a very um, important partnership for us. We also raised $380,000, which were paid immediately and directly to our three grantees. Um, we'll talk more about that on the financials page. So that was year one. Um, these are the three grants we gave. Uh, we gave money to, this is on our website, but we, we dispersed funds to Dr. Holder at Baylor, Dr. Roomba at Scripps, and Dr. Huguenier at Hopkins. Um, and in all cases, we were funding at least a postdoc. Um, so it's important to, to realize that while we want to help our kids tomorrow, we need to make sure that there's a next generation of researchers who will be learning about and building their careers on Syngap, which is why we try to fund things that include um, training from the next generation. So as you see in, in all of these where I put key people, I put both the lead researcher who we should mostly be familiar with, as well as uh, the postdoc in their lab who is working on SYNGAP. So this is what we started in 2018, and we're, we're very proud of this work. It's, it's, a, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of money and a lot of work. Um, in 2019, we hosted the first SYNGAP roundtable at AES, um, where Dr. Huguenier presented um, uh, an SRF-funded potential ASO, which I can, I can talk more about it. I think most people on this call are familiar. We also supported and attended the Precision Medicine for Epilepsy Conference. We launched the Wednesday Warrior Program and the Ambassador Program when we identified future partnership opportunities with the University of Southern California at Colorado Children's Hospital. We launched the Syngap Census. We had 12 blog posts, and we applied to Helix, CDI, and Joy and Global Gene. We raised another $377,000, so that was last year. Um, we talked about a few of those things on, on the next slide, but that, that gives you a sense of what we've done in 2019. Um, this slide has our two big events. It's the Precision Epilepsy Conference and the first annual roundtable. The Precision Medicine Epilepsy Conference was something that D um, Dan Lowenstein, who was on our SAB, organized five years ago. And he called us and he said, I want to do it again. Would you guys come and support it? And we said, absolutely. Um, Dan, for those who don't know, is a is a, is a very senior epileptologist. He's the vice chancellor of UCSF. And it's a great honor that he's on our board. But he's very passionate about epilepsy. And um, what he did here is he gathered, it was invite only, about 150 researchers and some patient advocates you see in that picture to come together and talk about, okay, what does precision medicine mean and what does the future look like? And it was an incredible use of two days for Ashley and I, who you see on the left of that picture, to go and just hear from the best minds in the space about about what the future looks like and it helped it frame our thinking a lot. We also hosted the um, first round table at AES. So AES <clears throat> is uh, a bit like summer camp for neurologists. Every year they, they all, most of them try to make it. And what a few groups have done is they've had hosted round tables on the sidelines of that. So Gervais, for instance, has done this now for 11 years. You, you have a breakfast or a lunch and you invite all the researchers and say, please come. And then while you have them captive, you, you have your researchers and your grantees present their work. And as you can see from that photo, the room was full of our grantees, our SAB, 30 or 40 other scientists and researchers and clinicians, and then a number of parents. Um, so this was, this was a tremendously successful event. And I, I'm still in touch with a few researchers who didn't know what Syngap was before they walked into that room and, and still now stay in close touch with us. So very positive use of time and money there. This is our SAB. We have Dr. Huguenier who um, helped identify the gene 20 years ago and continues to do a tremendous amount of research. Dr. Schaefer, 
uh, down from Australia, who is an, an amazing clinician researcher on, on the developmental epileptic encephalopathy, Dan Lowenstein, who I just mentioned, Dr. Dr. Heather Meffert, who is a geneticist at the UW, and she's a very um, understated personality, but if you look through the literature, you'll find her name on every paper that matters around epilepsy genetics. Um, Dr. Ampadori, who's the head of epilepsy genetics at Boston Children's Hospital, arguably one of the best hospitals in the country, and just a very kind and influential woman who is, is neck deep in um, a lot of the future of epilepsy therapy. And Ellie Brimble, who, when we met her, was our genetic counselor at Stanford. She has been gone on to join a company called Citizen as their director of ClinOps. She is a, a, a very talented genetic counselor and has helped us um, in many ways. She also sits on the SABs of a couple of other rare disease organizations. So this is a, this is a powerful group of people. And what's lovely is every time we email them, they, they all respond scarily fast. And it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, we're very proud of this group of advisors and thankful for their time. Wednesday Warrior, we've done 62 of these. If you're a parent on this call and you haven't had your kid on this, I encourage you to. It's just been a really successful program. We, we've shared um, the stories of 62 kids so far on Instagram and Facebook, and people have discovered each other living you know, a few miles away. People have learned about each other. And most importantly, I think newly diagnosed parents have gone to this channel and read stories and, and, and seen that there's a, there's, a, there's a future and a lot of smiles their newly diagnosed child. So this has just been a, a great experiment. Like so many things we do, it's something other rare disease groups do. And we've looked at it and said, yeah, our community deserves to have that too. And we've copied it with their, with their blessing. So Wednesday Warrior is a, a, a great program. If you're not a part of it, please join. If you, um, when you see a post come up, please share it. Let, you know, it helps everybody who's out there learn more about Syngap. There's a brief article we've written about why we think it's a great idea. I also want to mention the ambassador program started in 2019 um, under Virginia's leadership. These, these six and there's more people, um, but these are the ones on our website, reach out to newly diagnosed families and, and work with families in their geography. Um, we're just very lucky to have this group of people supporting families and, and we're thankful for them. If you go to the, that link at the bottom, thinkfresearchfund.org slash family empowerment, you can you can click through on their bios and also read our welcome pack and and find links to support groups. So very very important program from SRF that was started in 2019, which brings us to 2020. Um, in the first quarter of 2020, in the past three months, what have we done? We raised funds for the US the Organoid Project. We funded second round of grants to um, Scripps and, and Texas Children's Hospital, or second round of funding, I should say. We represented Singap for Rare Disease Week. Peter, who was on this call, went to Capitol Hill at the invitation of PMC, which we're a member of, and, and spoke to um, uh, a packed house with, with three other very distinguished speakers in the rare disease space and represented Singap really well. We were presented at the CSD for an ICD-10 code that was all due to Hans's good work, um, who's been beating this drum for a long time. We recruited a board of families, which I'll talk about in a second. We joined Combined Brain and the Precision Medicine Coalition, put up eight blog posts, and we raised another hundred and we banked another hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars. Some of which was raised at the end of 2019. So it's a it's a very productive quarter. Uh, if you just go to our blog, we elaborate on a couple of those things that I talked about. There's this article about the the organoid study. The update there is we, we raised enough money that with our match, we are there. We were in the final moments of, of, of finalizing the, the, the signed agreement with USC and then coronavirus shut everything down. So once that lab opens back up, we will cut that check. There's a great article about Peter on this panel with BMC. If you don't understand what an ICD-10 code is and how important it is that we have one and how fortunate we are to potentially have one soon, please read that blog post about um, the ICD-10 code. And then there's also an article about where Hans did a Q&A for um, parents on coronavirus. And the other important thing there is that number 535. We updated our SYNGAP census and said that we know of at least 535 patients, um, 51 in the quarter. So that's a quick summary of what happened in 2019. And it tells you sort of the, the breathless journey we've been on for the past a little under two years, actually. We didn't really get started until the middle of 2018 and, and what SRF has achieved to date. So as we look forward to the rest of 2020, how do we think about our goals and what we think we should be doing? There's four big buckets. We need to increase patient and family empowerment. 
Um, that's education, blogs, webinars, and the welcome pack, and support the ambassador program, meetups, online groups. We, we are, at the end of the day, um, here to support our community and our patients. So that's got to be number one. Number two is partnerships and relationships. No matter how much money we raise or how hard we work, we're never going to be able to do this by ourselves. So we have to partner. That's, that's the, the heart of the Syngap Global Network is a, is, a, is a global network of organizations representing pa patients from various countries. That's across the rare community. We have to remember Syngap is just one of many rare diseases. There's a lot of other smart, hardworking parents out there and, and connecting with them, sharing knowledge and insights is, is a big part of what uh, I do all day long. Um, biotech, pharma, and healthcare data companies. At the end of the day, it's gonna take a ton of money to develop therapies for our kids. The private sector is where that money sits, and, and we have to partner with these companies. We are, we are actively in conversation with a couple of them. Um, and then, of course, researchers and clinicians. So, so partnerships and relationship building is, is at the heart of what we do, as is supporting research. But, you know, supporting research isn't just writing a check. You have to figure out where the checks are going, and that's informed largely by the knowledge we get from those partnerships. So it's grants to key labs. Increasing patient data, I'm going to talk more about that in a second. And then the annual roundtable is, I can't understate how valuable it is to have great scientists like um, Rick and Ingrid and Steve Petru, who presented last year, in a room and telling, you know, postdocs and, and, and young professors, hey, come have a free meal and, and hear from these guys directly. It, it, it's just such a valuable exercise, and you're definitely going to do it every year. This year it will be in Seattle, assuming the coronavirus. Um, problems have passed and you can come, please think about joining us in Seattle in December. And then of course we have to mobilize resources. This all costs money um, and, and we need to do fundraising events to support that. So these are the four buckets I think about for 2020 uh, to guide our work. This is an important slide. It, it just talks about our partners. Global Genes is an umbrella org for rare disease. It's remarkable. The Epilepsy Leadership Council is the group of patient organizations um, that sit under AES. We joined that in order to have that round table. Uh, PMC, Personalized Medicine Coalition, is a large sort of industry advocacy group, I think, for everybody in personalized medicine, especially the diagnostic companies. They, they do invite a few advocacy groups. We have been invited, and, and that's, that's a really important group to be a part of. Agenda is the Alliance of Neurodevelopmental Disorders that relate to autism. And these aren't just logos we're putting on a slide. People go to meetings for these things. We engage in work groups. We, we attend events. So all of these things are, are a chunk of work. Combined Brain is, is an effort. If you're not familiar with it, I would ask you to Google it. We have been invited to join that. It is a group of, I think it's up to 25 now, rare disease groups under the leadership of Dr. Terry Joe Bichelle, who um, was a leader for many years in the Angelsman's community. Angelman's and Dravet, I would say, are two very organized communities that have come a long way. They're about a decade ahead of us, and they've all got therapies under development right now that are about to be dosed into patients. So Terry said, okay, my kid's going to be okay with Angelman's. How do I help other groups? She created Combined Brain. Really excited about that. Simon Searchlight is, I'm going to talk about that in a second for those who don't know. It, it's an effort by the Simon Foundation to collect patient data. We, we very much support and encourage people to use that. And of course, Syngap Global Network, which I described before, this is the organization of almost every Syngap organization on the planet that we are an active participant in and, and very glad to support. So collaboration, at the end of the day, if you look at our logo, collaboration, transparency, urgency, this is what we say we do. Um, I think those past few slides illustrate pretty well. We collaborate actively. We work with everyone we can to drive SYNGAP research forward. That's, that's the purpose of what we're doing. If, it, if we're not furthering SYNGAP research, it's not something that I'm interested in, in SRF supporting, frankly. Um, super excited about this one. Uh, I want to flag this because it's going to come up on the grants page, and I don't think many people are aware of it. Dr. Scott Demarest runs a lab at Colorado Children's, and um, he sees people like us, right? People who show up and say, what's going on um, with my kid? And he, he helps them. And uh, he's, very, he's developed a strong partnership with CDKL5, with SLC16A, with anyone who is in this space who knows what they're doing and says, wow, this guy's, this guy's really good. And we're fortunate already to have people like Ingrid Schaefer and, and Jimmy Holder 
But what Scott said is, you know, a lot of clinicians don't have people coming to their lab with a label. My kid, they just say, my kid, look, something's up. What, how, help me. It, you know, it takes a long time to get a diagnosis. And he said, we need to train more doctors um, in, in supporting kids who present with, before diagnosis and helping them through this journey. There's a, there's a body of knowledge here that needs to be developed. And in partnership with the International Foundation for CDKL5 Research, he said, Let, let's start training clinicians along this line. And CDKL5 is, is a very well-funded and well-organized organization. But, you know, at the end of the day, Scott said, I'm only going to be half my patients at most in CDKL5. We should ask other groups to fund this. And CDKL5 came to us and RIN14 and a number of other groups and said, would you guys be interested in partially funding a clinician for a year under Scott's training? And... Fortunately, they asked so many people, it's going to be five or $10,000 a year, which, which we're happy to support. Um, but for me, it, what's most exciting is they went to a group of rare disease groups like RIN14, CDKL5, FDM1A, I could go on, and said, would you jointly collaboratively fund something that will help all of us in the end and, and build this model of what a DEE uh, clinic looks like? And, and I think that SRS and our board and our leadership being involved in that partnership and being able to learn from each other and learn how to cope on things and build strong relationships is, is worth the money before we even recognize that we're helping Scott learn how to train the next generation of clinicians. Scott, I should add, is, is, is well-respected in the space. He's, he and Ingrid are aligned on many thoughts, and um, we're lucky to have him as, a, as an advisor as well. So this is something we will be funding um, pretty soon, actually, and it's going to happen, and I'm really excited about it partnership there. One more thing, Syngap family, this is sort of like a commercial. If you're a Syngap family on this call and you haven't yet done Simons, I'm urging you to do Simons. Um, just a quick summary. It, the Simons Foundation is a very large autism funded autism focused foundation in New York. They have billions with a B. Um, and they fund registries for, for many autism related genes. So it's best in class, right? They have uh, tremendous clinicians. They have my computer just stopped presenting. I don't know why. Um, we'll go back. Um, they have tremendous clinicians. They have um, genetic counselors on staff. They have lawyers. Their data is on servers. There's, they, they, they're not short of funds, right? So they, you know, when I when when I signed up for this when I was diagnosed, I said to the genetic counselor, because I signed up. And, consent and then someone calls you and starts asking questions. And I said, well, what, why is this special? And she said, well, if you were just answering a questionnaire online of like some other registry, it would just be your opinion and your opinion will differ from other parents' opinions. But I'm a genetic counselor. This is all I do all day. And I'm going to take your data this year and, and I'm going to take someone else's data next year. And if someone's confused about a term, I'm going to help them make sure that, we're, that, that, that they understand what we're talking about. So the data is going to be really high quality. And, and better than that, I'm going to call you next year, and I'm going to call you the year after that, and I'm going to call you the year after that, and I'm going to keep updating this information. So, so we're, we're developing a really rich and highly quality controlled data set for your kids that any researcher can call us and say, hey, I want to do some analysis, and they can use it. And I was like, great, I'm sold. Um, Simon Foundation also funds research. So if you read... Um, a couple weeks ago, we posted an article about Helen Beta, who's doing research at UC Berkeley. That is because Simons called her and said, hey, you're doing great research on TSC, which is another disease. We think Syngap is also important. Would you do the same thing for TS for Syngap? And she said, yeah. So by, by giving our data to the Simons search site, we're, we're encouraging Simons Foundation to keep looking at Syngap and, and informing their funding decisions. So if you do nothing else as a result of this call, I urge you to go to simonsearchlight.org. If you're not signed up, sign up. If they've been bugging you for an annual update, please make the time. Um, they hate it when I say this, but they actually pay you for your time. They send you a gift card to thank you. So it's, it's, you just, it's, there's no downside to this. And, and it's, um, Simon's Foundation is a, is a tremendous organization, and we're grateful for this registry that they run. Okay, so that was my goals for 2020. Uh, don't worry, these sections are going to get smaller. Coronavirus update, you can't. Can't talk to anyone these days without talking about coronavirus, right? So what has coronavirus done? It's put all research on hold. All labs are closed. Um, fortunately, I think our mites are being kept alive, but I, a lot of rare disease groups can't say that. I think it, it's a function of every university has their own policies. I think a lot of cell lines are, are going to have to be rebuilt, which breaks my heart. I think our organoids at USD will be kept alive. Um, Professor Koba is working hard on that, but it's, it's tricky. 
Um, it's thrown all of us into disarray. Our kids have lost services, and it's going to make fundraising, frankly, really challenging. Um, I think the economic consequences of this will carry on, and it's hard to raise money in a recession. So it, it, it makes us thinking harder about fundraising and how we're going to do it um, all the more important. So what have we done? We've shared a lot of resources from other rare disease organizations. You've probably seen this um, both in our newsletter and on our support groups on Facebook. We held a webinar for families who had questions that you can watch a recording of on our blog. And we started a weekly check-in for families um, every Wednesday at 5. If you haven't joined, please do. They're really pleasant. It's just great to talk to other families, and that's an open Zoom line. I think that will become a tradition. So quick acknowledgement that coronavirus is, has put research on hold. It's going to make fundraising challenging, and it's, it's hard for all of us. I'm, I'm extra grateful for everyone making time for this update. Grant status, what's going on? So what you see on the left is how much money we need to spend on grants this year, if it's $421,000. Um, still due this year is 310 and paid out already is 111000 So we owe, we owe Hawkins a large check. That lab is currently closed. Once that lab reopens, we're, we, we just need one financial statement from them, and that check will go out. As I mentioned before, we have the 50000 for USC. Once that lab reopens, it'll go out. And then there's a partnership with Colorado Children's for 10 Actually, it might be five. I haven't received the invoice yet. But, so we have another 310 going out. We've already paid out to Scripps and Baylor. So um, just a quick glance at where we sit with the grants. Um, I did ask both Gavin and Rick, who have been get mice in their labs, what's going on with the mice. And they said, don't worry, they're safe. Someone's taking care of them. Um, I, saw, I saw Rick getting into a, a session on Twitter this morning saying with someone that you know, I don't, the only people in my lab are people feeding mice. Everyone else should be at home. So I'm, I'm glad to see you say that. Um, where do we sit with our financials? So there's a, there's, an, there's a web address in the top of this slide. If you go to this web address, everything I'm about to say is, is there in much more detail. But essentially, there's three tables here. The top table is what is, you would get from our bank account. So we have an exceptionally talented um, board member and volunteer, Rebecca. She's a financial professional by day. She's gone through. She has built our books. And um, this is based on all the transactions from our bank account. So donations that have hit our account, $535,000. Research dollars out the door, 111. What we've spent on programs, 41. What we've spent on overhead, 31. So we have $350,000 in the bank. Um, this is accurate for our bank account, but it is not an accurate representation of what we've done. If you go to table two, you can see that the two yellow boxes, I've added $385,000 in 2018 to both donations and research. So the story here is right when we were created, we, we set up those three grants. And because we are, we're brand new, we didn't yet have tax status, our donors should, uh, can and should get a tax benefit for making donations. So in order to not have them take any risks, uh, our donors cut checks directly to the labs for the first round of funds. So instead of giving us a donation and maybe or maybe not getting a tax receipt, um, they wrote checks directly to Hopkins, Baylor, and Scripps, and they got tax receipts from them. But those were checks written for SRF grants. And if you go to our grants page and read the grant agreement, I don't know how much of that you heard, but I was just saying that if, I, if you go to the bottom of table C, once you adjust for money that was paid directly to grantees in 2018 and money we expect to pay out in 2020, these numbers on the bottom right are the numbers, the way to think about it. We have raised $900,000 for St. Gap Research. We've paid out $786,000. That's 87% that's of the money we've raised. Um, we've spent $41,000 on programs. That's, that's things like going to conferences and um, you know paying, uh, paying people to get things done. This is all explained in our, in our article, um, which the link is at the top. And then we spent 31000 on overhead. That's unavoidable costs like lawyers, accountants, web hosting, et cetera. I will point out that all overhead costs are paid um, by Ashley and I, the founders. So if, you give, if anyone gives a penny to Syngap Research, they're only paying for research, right? Um, we cover all overheads. I, very few organizations can say that. And, and we, I think it's important that families are – and their friends who are giving money to SRF know that it's going, um, it's going only to research. All, all of the costs of the plumbing and the piping are, are, are covered by us. So all of this is publicly available on that blog post. Please read it. If you have questions, please let us know. Um, our goal is to be transparent. So collaboration, transparency, urgency, we live this mantra. 
um, anyone you give money to, whether it's SRF or United Way or whomever, you deserve to know where that money is going, how it's being spent, and, and what you're supporting. So, you know, I feel very strongly about that personally, having spent many years in, in different organizations that do philanthropy, and um, and and we're living we're living those values here. So. Moving on, a new board and what it means. This is really exciting. Um, we're about to have a, a old board meeting, I think, in the next few days. We'll, we'll make this formal, but um, we are moving from the board as it sits at this very moment to a, board, a new board of 12 families. Um, the board is the, the original board was Ashley and I, who are the founders, and we're married, and um, a scientific advisor and an old friend of mine from the Gates Foundation, Phil. Um, that really made sense at the beginning because it was really Ashley and I who were starting this and, and we wanted to keep close tabs on it. I, I think, and I hope you will agree after this presentation, that SRF has grown to a level where it, it's, it's beyond the startup phase. And so what we did is we did a public call and said, who, who would like to be on the board of this? Who would like to steer this? And, and these 12 people agreed to um, join the board. Um, Ashley is still very much a supporter, but we've said, okay, it doesn't make sense to have married couples on here anymore. So while there's 12 names on this board, it's really 12 families that are represented. Um, a lot of these people in, in, with their, in close partnership with their spouses work hard on, on SRF. But you see here, um, Aaron and Olga will be the co-chairs of this board. Virginia is here. We have Pavel, Kali, Hans, um, Vicky, Chris, Peter, Summer, myself, and Rebecca. I, I'm really excited about working with, with this board and seeing it continue to grow and, and change. We're going to tranche the terms, so it'll be three-year terms, so in a year before these people will roll off, and maybe some will stay, maybe some will, will be replaced. But um, I'm really excited to see SRF work on behalf of Singap families and be represented and led and governed by Singap families. So this is a really positive development, and, and stay tuned for blogs on this. Wrapping up, next steps, I'm going to try to keep us to 30 minutes so we have time for questions. Is that, you know, if you as a parent hang up after this call and say, okay, what do I do now? Step one is data matters. Please go to Sun and Search Light. Step two, I haven't talked about this, but we're, um, we're thinking a lot about doing a, a, another data initiative with a company called Citizen. I'll talk about that in a second, um, but just stay tuned and look for that. We, as, as you all know, rare families live online, so please follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to our newsletter, look out for Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, but I think Facebook and newsletter are the big ones in our, in our blog, of course. Um, SyngapResearchFund.org, Syngap blog is where you can see the latest, and then if you subscribe to our newsletter, in case you miss the blog, you'll get a note. If you want to help raise funds or if you want to do some work yourself, please contact us. Please reach out through the website, or if you know some of us on Facebook, just, just ping us, and we are there for you. I'm happy to talk about Citizen. Um, it, is, it is a bit future state. It hasn't, been, it hasn't happened yet, but um, it's something we're working on. However, I have said a lot, so I'm going to stop here, and whether you want to use the chat function or whether you want to unmute yourself, if anyone has questions right now, anything I've said, I'm happy to take questions. No questions? Do you want to just have me talk about Citizen? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Talk about Citizen. <laughs> Actually, Mike, I have one quick question. This is Olga. Um, yes, ma'am. Simon Searchlight. Uh, we did yep. uh, the other research, I think. Begins with an S. I just want a spark. Are they related? Yes. So Simon Searchlight is a rebrand of Simon VIP, which is part of Spark, which is part of Safari. It's all, all those things starting with S are generally Simon, um, okay. which just feels to, speaks to the scale and the scope. But if you did Simon VIP, um, that, is, that, that has become Simon Searchlight. I think you have to re I think you have to reconfirm something. They've probably sent you 30 emails on it. They bugged the hell out of me until I finally did it. But you know, again, every year the data gets updated, so we encourage people to do it. That's a really, that's a great question, Olga. Thank you. Okay, so I should probably go back and and re-register, or well, check what Simon Search Light. Probably, I think just 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 contact them and say, hey, what's up? When am I due for my update? Do I need to do anything? 
Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, so Simon Searchlight is a different project, um, and the data collected is different than the Spark project. Okay. So, it, all right. So they oh, don't sorry. They're, cross they're over. <laughs> they're under the same umbrellas, but they are two separate, uh, two separate projects. Okay. All right. Well, I'll I'll go back to Simon Searchlight then and and start that one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, Aaron, you're right. I stand corrected. So there's Simon Spark, which is one thing, and then there's there's Simon. But but I guess I answered a different question that I should have mentioned. Simon Searchlight was Simon's VIP, right? So if yes. you were in Simon's VIP, that has now become Simon Searchlight. But if you if you did Spark, which is more research focused, and you're not in Simon Searchlight, please go and sign up for Simon Searchlight. Okay, that's that's funny too. It, Thanks. And in, and, and in fact, I would encourage everybody if you're if you have an autism diagnosis or uh, not. Uh, both projects are very intelling, um, and they're still working on enrollment for the Spark project. So another worthwhile, given as Mike and I would argue that this is one of the best funded organizations in the space um, that we could participate in. And you don't have to be specifically uh, autism focused. For Simon Searchlight and Pam. Correct. Any other questions, Marta? I see you're unmuted. Do you have any? Uh, the, the, if, uh, the best way to know if you are in Simon's taste send the periodic um, update, you have to update. And if somebody is on Simon's, they should be getting like, like uh, emails. I, I don't remember every three months that you have to update information. Um, so my experience has been, I just did my, my, just did my third update. So we got diagnosed two years ago. So we, we signed up promptly and we did one then. And a year ago they called me and then last, I think I just was on the phone with them two weeks ago. I get so it. I think, by, I think it's an annual update. I get it by email. I actually am due to update some information. Then they emailed me and I get it hmm. by email. I haven't got called for a while. I just get everything by email and I update the information on email. I go through the questionnaire. Yeah. That's, I, I'm pending to do one. I got one like 10 days ago to update information. Yeah. I don't know. I think we, we as an organization couldn't emphasize enough of supporting of the Simon Searchlight given the level of um, integrity and data management um, and the resources that are put into it from a genetics perspective all the way through. So, Martha, I'm happy to follow up with you after if you want to um, double check. Because sometimes if there's specific things they want, like they'll, they'll email you, but I'm surprised they haven't done an interview unless they have you classified as not, as yeah. not English speaking. Um, <laughs> I know they're broadening to other. No, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. If, if, you, if you say your first language is in English until recently, I think they've said they, they can't do interviews because they want to make sure because they're that serious about data quality. So, um, but I know they're adding other languages and I know Spanish is one of them, so that shouldn't be the case. Um, although, I mean, I, I, I know you're a doctor and you can function very well in English, but look, let's, um, let's follow up with them. I'm curious about that. Okay, we'll do. Cool, that'd be, anybody else? Or should I talk a little bit about Citizen? Okay, so this is, um, I wanna just preface this by saying this is not yet done. This is something we're working on and very excited about, but in the spirit of transparency, I'm, I'm super excited to share it with you. Oh, yeah, I should, last thing, part of the thing, urgency. So I just gave you a bunch of things to do. Um, here's why. Our children's brains are being built right now. What, what can we do right now to help them and to help the thousands of kids coming soon? And I, I, I don't talk about this enough, but, you know, our 525 diagnosed kids around the world are just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we all know how hard it was to get diagnosed in many cases. And you can imagine how many people didn't get through that journey. And, and so I think it's important to realize that even though our community is relatively small in terms of diagnosed families, what we're doing right now has an impact for the thousands of kids who, who will hopefully be diagnosed um, as that, those processes get better. So this is why I always sound like I'm in a hurry. But let me talk about, um, talk about citizens. So there's two data efforts that, that I would like to see SRF support. One is Simon Searchlight, which we've talked about annual data based on interviews with genetic counselors, some medical reports from families, Simon's Foundation pays for everything, and the Simon's IRB, which is the, all of these things are governed by an IRB, grants access to researchers. No brainer, free, high quality, do it. But what they're collecting is annual data based on interviews. 
right? Citizen is an effort um, that already exists and already does this for cancer. So it was, and I would urge everybody, because you're going to be hearing more about it, I would urge everybody to do a little Googling, watch videos about them, learn about them. The CEO of this company is a very successful um, uh, tech CEO. Uh, his last company was sold to Apple and became Apple Medical Records. And then his sister was diagnosed with cancer. And um, they, spent, they spent six months in, in the last six months of her life fighting that. And um, unfortunately, she passed. But in that time, she went to 13 institutions. And her brother saw how hard it was to get those institutions to share data. So he built Citizen as a way to share data. And um, since then, he has, uh, fortunately for us, employed someone who is another rare disease leader. And she said, you could use this for rare disease. And basically, what Citizen will do is it will, I'll talk about this on the next few slides. Uh, what they do now for cancer patients, I should say, is if you're a cancer patient and you've been seen at five institutions, they will go to those five institutions and, and using HIPAA, actually, will say to those five institutions, this patient has consented, please share all of their data. They will take all of that data, every single page of every medical record from every hospital they've been to, the machines will read it, the clinicians will check it, and then they will create a dashboard so that when that patient walks into the next institution, there's a, there's a consolidated summary of all their medical records in a way that's accessible, thousands of pages in like an app, basically. And then more importantly, um, as they do that for hundreds and hundreds of patients, when a pharma company wants to come along and find a certain kind of patient for a certain kind of work for a trial, the data is already there. There's no, there's, no, there's, no, it, it, there's no hunting and pecking. It's all already organized. So when they said they were going to do rare and wanted to pilot with some rare disease groups, we got really excited. Um, there is, this is not free, unfortunately, um, but it's an amount of money that I think SRF can absorb. And um, so this is still to be discussed with the board, but I think we're gonna find our way through here. So SRF will cover the cost. Patients will always control the access. So basically you are, if I, when I do this, I will give Citizen my permission to gather Tony's records. They will go to the, I don't know how many, he's been to like five hospitals. They will go to the five hospitals Tony's been to, pull all the data into a dashboard. If, if Dr. Sheffer or Dr. Holder or, or Scott Demarest wants to do research, they would get free research. If and when one of the pharma companies decides to work on Syngap and they want to gather this data, um, patients would be reminded that they've given consent, but then at that point, anything SRF had paid would be refunded to SRF and pharma would, would pay for the, the, the data, which frankly, we want to happen, right? We want pharma to be able to study and learn about our kids. So we're creating something that's of value here. Um, and I think it's a good effort. These next few slides are from Citizen, um, data driven by patients, fast and seamless, what they do, you know, allow patients to collect and store and share your health information so you can share this then with your clinician, around advocacy groups to basically build registries on, on top of this and, and allow biopharma to deal with clean data, which is, which is a major issue. And the next two slides are pretty. Basically, slide, bullet one is what I just told you about. You give consent, they collect the medical records, and they've built pipes into all the major medical record systems. This happens pretty effortlessly. Those efforts, those medical records are translated, transferred to citizens, they're ingested, they're digitized, and then um, other questions can be added to those. Citizens Engine then builds a clinical summary, which I'll show you on the next page. And, and if Biopharma um, got our consent and paid for it, they would be able to get this data and, and find the patients they needed or learn about our disease, which we want them to do, right? We wanna make it easy for pharma to help our kids. And the coolest slide I think is this one. So um, as I mentioned, the, the head of rare disease at Citizen is a woman named Nasha Fritter. Nasha is um, the mother of a girl with FOXG1. So what you're seeing here is an example, um, probably based on her kids. Um, probably based on Amara. So basically what you see on the left is what you would be able to, so imagine you go see Scott Demarest, or imagine you, go, you move and you go to a new hospital and they say, tell me about your kid. And you've got you've been to five hospitals. Well, now you just take out your app and you're like, here's the deal. Primary diagnosis is FOXG1, secondary diagnosis is boom, boom, boom. Here, based on all of their visits with all their docs is, is their, their critical data over time. If you want to see imaging, I've got a copy of the image here, the EEG is here. If you want to know more about these secondary diagnosis, you click on infantile spasms and you get a little more detail here. Uh, the global development of the light, when it was diagnosed, who diagnosed it, what actually it says in the records. 
And then if you like, I don't understand the spasm thing, you click on that and, and their app will actually pull up the piece of paper in your medical record that shows the doctor that. So it's a very powerful tool. And I personally would love to have this for, for my son, of course, but I would also love to, for all of our patients to have this and to be able to talk to the next biotech that realizes they should study SYNGAP um, and say to them, hey, there is data on 50, 100, whatever it is, patients, full rich data that, that you, we can facilitate access to that you can understand how your drug would help these kids. So I think this is pretty exciting. We are, this is not done. This is, a, this is an active discussion, um, but it's something that I'm, I think could be a valuable asset. And, it, and it, instead of, because the thing is when you go to anyone now and they say, we need to do a natural history study and we need to gather 20 kids and we need to do all these tests to them, blah, 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 blah. And it's going to cost, generally it's like a hundred thousand bucks a kid by the time you fly them to a hospital, perform all these tests that have already been performed on them, pay, pay researchers, pay nurses, pay this. And you sit in there thinking as a parent, haven't I already done this? Haven't I already hasn't my kid already had a lumbar puncture, two MRIs, 10 EEG, 37 doctor visits? Like, why on earth am I doing it again and paying for it? And, and in a sense, this isn't a replacement for a natural history study, but it's, it, it is capturing what's already there. And, and that's a rich data set that, that might be um, very useful. And, and now that Citizen has built this tech for cancer um, and has been willing to repurpose it for rare disease, I think we, I think we are staring at a cool opportunity. So this is something that SRF is working on, um, and I'm excited to um, see grow. That's the that's the prepaid advert there. All right, so it's 9:50. I've been on the phone for about 45 minutes because we started late. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, if there are no more questions, I'm happy to um, thank you all for joining and look forward to staying in touch. Any questions? Mike, I do have one quick question on, on the citizen. Um, this is all US yeah, hospitals. Yeah. So assuming that when you've been to a clinician that's affiliated with that hospital, you would have that information. So I'm right. just thinking so about- So if, if it's in any major medical record system, it would be, once the patient consents, it would be, I think, absorbable. Um, okay. I don't know about my, you know, like random pediatrician Tony went to two years ago. I don't know that their records would get pulled in, but yeah. I think most of our medically complex kids, a lot of the meaty stuff is in, is in the hospital system, but I'm, I'm going to clarify. That <laughs> our pediatricians affiliated with Texas children. So it's all there. Right. Okay. So you would be fine. Yep, basically on the hospital. Okay. Mike, I had a question on citizen. Um, have they done any work with clients in Europe? No, we, we've talked about that. We've talked about Europe. We've talked about Australia. Um, part of the magic of, of how they get it done right now is they use HIPAA is generally used to keep us away from our data. But what they've done is they've hired a, their head of legal is a senior lawyer from the U.S. government who um, worked on HIPAA and has turned it upside down and reminded the hospital that they are obliged within a pretty tight window. I think it's 10, 30 days to provide data when patients request it. So what they do is they go to the hospitals and they say, these, these 20 SYNGAP patients have consented, right? You can imagine that at least 20 of us have been to Texas Children's. So if we all consented, they would go to Texas Children's and say, hey, you have 30 days to, to comply, but don't worry, here's an API. You know, you plug your computers into our computers, we'll just suck up the data. Um, and so part of their success with cancer has been based on HIPAA, which is a U.S. law. So now they have to think about, okay, how is that going to work in the European context, especially when you get into... Um, non-US languages and they are working on it, but it's not it's not ready to fly quite yet. Thank you. Okay, so my email is Mike at syncapresearchfund.org. If anyone has more questions or wants to talk later, um, I'm available. And uh, thank you everybody for joining this call. I hope it was useful. I will take this presentation and share it via a blog post probably in a day or so. So um, if anyone is curious about um, anything or wants to show it to someone else, it, it'll be there for you. And if there's no other questions, have a great day. Stay healthy. Thank you, Mike. Thank, Thank you. you.
A pleasure. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.